черные. Very good morning, everyone. I welcome you all on behalf of Indo-American Chamber of Commerce, North India Council. And it's a uh, today's topic is very important when we are celebrating our Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav as well as we are hosting G20. And uh, we decided to organize a program on women's health innovation so that everybody can speak about their views on women's health innovation. Now, with these words, I, I would like to invite our national president, Dr. Lalit Bhasinji, to give his address. Dr. Sir, please join us. Thank you. Thank you, Bhasna Ji. Am I audible? Sir, you are very much audible. Clear yes, and loud. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we have a galaxy of uh, eminent speakers, not only in the inaugural session, but also in the working session, the technical sessions. In the inaugural session, we have the distinguished presence of Dr. Naresh Trehan, uh, MS Sangeeta Patel, who represents USAID in India, and the Love Agarwal, the National Secretary, Ministry of Health and Family Development Government of India, besides uh, Dr. Upasna Aroda and Mr. Arun Karna. At the outset, I congratulate IACC Northern Region particularly the regional president, Dr. Upasna Aroda, for organizing this interactive session, keeping in tandem with the world trends in evolving gender-based clinical approaches. Let me try to explain the scope of such interactions from my own perspective. We are all talking about gender equality, emancipation and empowerment of women at various fora. Multilateral organizations like the United Nations, UNICEF, ILO, WTO have their own charters and resolutions to address these issues. Basic to these lofty objectives to bring women into the mainstream is the realization that a sound health support system is there to help them realize their potential, particularly due to biological factors and mental makeup. That way, I understand women's health innovation is the branch of medicine that focuses on treatment and diagnosis of diseases and conditions that affect a woman's physical and emotional well-being. To me, it also instructs that there is an urgent need for innovations going beyond <coughs> contraceptive and other birth control measures to help address emotional and on-site challenges being faced by women to build their confidence and courage to take up higher challenges in life beyond the perquisites of the comfort zone. It's a great initiative by the Northern region of the Indo-American Chamber of Commerce. And without taking much time, I once again thank you all for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts with the panel of health experts. I am sure a constructive debate would ensure where newer ideations and approaches would spring up. Thank you all. And now I request Dr. Upasna Aroda, Regional President, Indo-American Chamber of Commerce, Northern India Council, to please deliver her address and take the proceedings forward as the moderator. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, sir. 
and uh, because of your vision we are able to conduct this uh, interactive session today and i am very luck very lucky that dr trihan is here who is pioneer in healthcare and who is uh, created a very good facility for everyone same time why we are talking about women health as everybody knows that now we are the number one country who is population wise we have now china is behind us and we are number one in population and if you think about that uh, if female is not healthy then how she can give birth to a healthy child and if child is not healthy then how can we make a nation healthy so everything rotated uh, around a female a woman so it's high time that we should uh, think about females health as foxy has also taken a um, uh, initiative and they started a uh, road show and journey uh, for just to eliminate anemia because anemic females are actually so much suffering uh, in india because when they are uh, pregnant and they they are not having good hemoglobin so there is lots of complication at the time of birth and as well as uh, child also so now i will not take much time because we have expert with us so now i would like to invite our uh, most famous and our uh, handsome our visionary our uh, actually mentor for many dr naresh tehan who is chairman of and managing director and chief cardiac surgeon of medanta the medicity sir you you no need of any introduction everybody knows you please enlighten us with your wisdom words good morning upasna thank you for all the kind words uh, so women's health per se has always been a subject of interest and concern to all physicians but because of the fact that women's rights have taken a giant stride in the sense that equality which was always necessary has now become actually a reality so talking about women's health what is peculiar about women's health is that one what they are child bearing so let us first go to the antenatal stage for women so to be able to be a healthy child carrier you need to have the following one your nutrition your your weight your bone structure all these things are very important to be able to carry a baby healthily and like mentioned by upasna your hemoglobin and all that so what we suggest today is for before you get get pregnant that you should have a full checkup including an echocardiography because x number of people will not know that they have certain abnormalities in their heart and before they get pregnant and when the extra load comes on the heart because of the progressing pregnancy that these things then come out later and then cause a huge problem during the pregnancy so that is why every child bearing mother who intends to get pregnant must get an antenatal full checkup including echo second of course during the pregnancy and all that that will be taken care of then let us go at what are the this factors that are peculiar to women so the most common three things that happen is one is heart disease and the myth that if women get don't get heart disease is not correct and the second is cancer bone cancer is is, is rare in women but breast cancer and cervical cancer is the most common and they are easily screened for that so cervical cancer can be screened by a simple test known as pap smear and breast cancer can be not eliminated but detected early enough by physical exam by mammograms so that if some a, a female takes care of her breast tissue examination regularly by a physician or learn to do it yourself then you can detect very early changes and then be able to be get a cure actually today if science has enhanced the ability of uh, of medicine 
to cure any cancer, it is first breast cancer. Because if detected in time, women can live normally after that. And that's why it is very important that early detection is essential. Now, women are protected from heart disease by their hormones known as estrogen till menopause. So menopause is a, is a watershed moment in, the, in a woman's body where everything changes its complexion. So what we always want is, one, that at the time of menopause, your bone health, your physical health, and physical health means regular exercising that you do, which you should introduce early in life, but if you haven't worked for any reason, you must, before you reach menopause, a few years before that, you must exercise regularly and incorporate yoga into your life for two reasons. One, exercise actually keeps your muscle mass intact, which is very important for developing immunity. The second, it keeps your bones healthy because women are very prone to osteoporosis. So with regular exercise, your bone health will stay okay. So what today the new discovery in medicine is, what we call know your genes. That means that you must know your family history. If there is diabetes in the family, that means your mother or father, if even one of them has diabetes, then the chances of children developing diabetes double. So if it was the general population was to get uh, a six to 7% people will develop diabetes, it will double. And if God forbid both the parents have diabetes, it will double again. So that is why it is important that we must know our family history because diabetes can be actually prevented or delayed or controlled very, very successfully by us, by introducing the food habits and the, ex and the exercise, and if at all need be, some simple medicines. The other thing that genes will tell us is heart disease. If you have, the general population in India will have about a 10 to 12% chance of developing heart disease. If one parent has heart disease, then it, it increases to double, and both parents have it, then it is, and women are not exempt from that. So that means that women should not, as we say, women generally will have less heart disease before menopause. But if you have family history, then again, you're at the same level. You, you, you cannot escape it because it may affect you also. So these are the things that you bark in the back of your mind, diabetes and heart disease, and especially in women, in breast cancer, we know that we have the genes that we have identified, which tell you whether if your mother or anybody in you know, the mother or, or her mother had uh, breast cancer, then we can actually look for those genes. They're known as BRCA2, but the basic thing is that you can actually detect the presence of genetic propensity for breast cancer. So moving forward, after menopause, women and men will have the same incidence of heart disease. Especially what we have seen recently is that there is a rising incidence of smoking in women. If you are a smoker, not only are you at risk at heart, at heart disease, also lung cancer. So that's why we say keep Continue the healthy habit of eating right and exercising regularly and doing yoga. These are the three things that are very essential in any healthy person's life. The reason I'll tell you, what, well, like I said, exercise will keep your muscle mass intact because as you age, your muscle mass goes down and your immunity goes down and you're open to many, many diseases. So it's very important to do that. Second, diet is, is to be controlled Mediterranean diet, as we say, is uh, you can it's it's available, so I don't have to waste time on that. But the basic thing is, healthy diet will keep your weight under control, because one of the ten tendencies that happens right after menopause is that women will put on weight, and that is one thing. If you put on weight, it's very difficult to get rid of it. That's why it's important to actually prevent it from happening. The third thing is that when 
you are going forward in your uh, in your life every decade new things will happen and as you know that the incidence of alzheimer also is is more prevalent in women than men and alzheimer's can be actually uh, prevented by like i said by exercise and then i mentioned yoga yoga is is the most important thing to keep all your systems in balance because that's the only thing that will actually give you mental health all the breathing exercises will give you mental health and these asanas of yoga will actually exercise all your all your uh, organs like the, the the ones that produce like thyroid like uh, adrenaline Adrenal, uh, adrenal glands they will actually be exercised only by yoga your liver your kidneys so that's where your organs will stay healthy also so if you incorporate all these things in your life then you can expect a, a longevity and it's not like we say now it's not how long you live is less said how healthy you live for how long so i think that overall women should be very aware of the fact that the peculiarities that i just mentioned that that is to them more important than to men and smoking has led to a rising trend of uh, lung cancer in women and also associated cancers because it is it triggers that whole response in the body so heart disease cancer uh i mentioned the two most common ones but and third is osteoporosis which leads to brittle bones and once you get injured your bones don't heal that fast so there are many many uh, women who will then get incapacitated because of brittle bone so if you take care of all these things you can expect to lead a healthy life and and also a mentally well adjusted life and avoid alzheimers or dementia as you move forward alcohol is the other thing that we which is a difference between men and women women can tolerate half the half the alcohol that men can so do not try to match a man one to one with drinks so if you are if you are a, a, a drinking then a glass of wine 4 ounces max per day is okay <clears throat> that also not every day we say three to four times a week is okay if you but otherwise if the men can tolerate eight ounces of wine a woman can tolerate four ounces of wine and not affect her health so i just noticed that i have overrun my time already in eight minutes were allotted but then i can go on forever on no, women's no, health no sir kind, kindly <laughs> sir take more time we will we will we are actually happy to listen you because whatever you are saying that is going to help many lives and it is going to you know impact on the many lives so kindly sir um, uh, more elaborated uh, your speech i would love to hear okay so you know what you can incorporate for yourself is one if you don't have a weighing scale get a weighing scale then you have like i said overall i gave you the incidence of heart disease but what are the constituents of heart problems so it is like i said obesity obesity does not not only give you heart disease but also cancer and any other renal failure liver failure you name it every every organ of the body gets affected by obesity so at all cost avoid that and it's very difficult because our indian diet is so rich and so tasty that you can it's it, you need a very very strong uh, will power to to actually be able to resist all that's put in front of you and then we are celebrating every day that somebody is born somebody is getting married somebody is this so so just be judicious in your thing and your weighing scale is your master the moment you put on 500 grams that is half a kilo that day you must take almost fast so that you bring back that 500 grams and you maintain your ideal body weight the second thing is that there are constituents like we said there is now a rising trend of colon cancer there is a rising trend of heart disease 
And one of the biggest things that I've seen is because if you're feeling healthy and you never go for a regular checkup, you may miss many, many of the things that were you were born with. For example, 1% of the, of the women will actually be born with what we call atrial septal defect, means that they're in the, inside their heart, a hole remains that you will not realize till you get short of breath later in life, but the damage is already done. So in the preventive checkup, each person, each woman, before, like I said, before the, you go get pregnant, you must have a full checkup. Second, every, if you are healthy and you don't have any risk factors, then you can do a checkup every two to three years till the age of 45. And then every year. Hypertension, high blood pressure is another very, very common thing that we find. We did a study on 10,000 executives, including one third of them were women. That 26% of people do not know that they have high blood pressure and they will only suffer either when they will get a side effect of it that may be a nosebleed, a brain bleed, bleed kidneys getting da damaged. So these are the kind of things that you have to, but the biggest enemy today in India is diabetes. Diabetes is a silent killer. It can be controlled, like I said, if you have family history or if you developed it, you didn't have family history and you discover you have developed diabetes, it's fully controllable. Because diabetes is one of those things that affects every organ of your body, starting from your brain, your eyes, your glands, your heart, your liver, your kidney, you name it, diabetes is affecting all these things. So be careful that you do not it, it go undetected for diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, and cancer. These are the four main things that a person must steer themselves clear of, and then you can expect a healthy life. So thank you very much. Um, if there are, sir, I don't know. Sir, it, it, I have it, a question it, from you, sir. Okay. Sir, what is your uh, advice to those? Actually, it is unfortunately in not only in India, but other part of the uh, world also. They think that uh, female doesn't need uh, good nutrition, especially in India. And if we talk about rural area, they always, uh, there is a discrimination in uh, diet between male and female. So what is your sir, advice to those who are doing this? Because I believe that female should have better diet because she is going to deliver a child. So, sir, I want to know your... Uh, because I am going to um, put this on uh, YouTube so everybody should know. Sir. You know, there has been culturally, religiously, uh, lack of education, you may call it, that at certain levels of our country, women are not treated as, as prime when they actually are prime, because they are the ones who take care of the family, they are the ones who propagate the family. But there is an inverted uh, sort of male bias, and which is not, which is actually reverse of what it should be. If you remember in, in some of our Hindu rituals, they, they worship Kanjakas at the time of Ram Naomi. Yes. At that a kanjak is a, supposed to be a blessing to the family. So they are the ones who bring all the, all the beautiful things to a family. Where uh, I think the entitlement for men actually started because they are mostly breadwinners at some point. And that entitlement has actually pushed the females aside, which is a very sad thing to have happened. But I think more and more people are getting aware of it. I see it in my own practice. When I came back to India in, in late 80s, 88, if a woman had heart problem and had crossed the age of 55, the, 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 the families felt at that time <coughs> that, excuse me, that they don't need any treatment because their life is over. At that time, it was, it was con uh, considered that a woman is just there to produce children. <coughs> Excuse me. So then what happens is that now go forward 20 years, 
Now, I've seen it in the last 10 years. Now, I've been back for 30 years. That in the last 10 years, the whole scenario has changed with the change of generation. Children today who are actually uh, out there making their own livelihood actually want to take care of their elderly, especially women. Till the late age of 80, 85, 90, they will not give up, which is a very welcome change in our in Indian psyche. So I think that there is a change, which is very, 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 I mean, it's late, but it's very welcome today. And I think that women are seeing the day in the sun today, and it will continue to grow. So we all need to be conscious of it. We all need to be aware of the, of the function of women in our life. So I think that this, it, it, their nutrition has to be actually concomitant with their, li their life as they go. And one big thing that women are actually, which I find, are not unhappy being fat. This is not a good thing. You have to be proud of your body. You have to be from the very beginning. Exercise enough. You don't have to be over over exercising, trying to be skinny, but you need to be, keep a healthy weight, which is, a, which is your ideal body weight, and not let yourself go at any point. That's the important thing to do. Okay, so... Sir, sir I need one more question. Sir, I, I really want your I answer. For one work more. Here. <laughs> we actually, in India, we believe that a child can listen and understand everything when he is in the womb of his or her mother. As we can see our, um, this Abhimanyu thing in uh, Gita. But sir, nowadays it's quite uh, uh, in that fetus health is also very important when child is inside the womb and whatever uh, is happening around him or her that is impacting his physical health as well as mental health. Sir, is it true, uh, scientifically proven, sir? Absolutely. Nutrition of a, a, of a, of a, of a, a woman who's pregnant, who's bearing the child, a child in the womb needs absolutely ideal nutrition and they must get that nutrition because otherwise you are creating a problem for life for the for the fetus and the baby so that is malnourishment at that stage is criminal and i'm glad the government has many schemes today yeah. where there is a huge huge uh, emphasis on maternal health and i think nutrition is very much part of it prevention of other diseases is part of it. And I think that this is, we are making, we are moving in the right direction, but I, we should just accelerate and do it ASAP. That's, that's simple. And you're right, the Abhimanyu effect is, is, is present in every way and form. And we all, often say that what, what happens in, in people who are, who are born to a business family where business is being discussed while they're in the womb, we think that they actually have already a head start in business because they've been, they've been uh, uh, listening. And it's very true that we believe that fetuses do receive. There's no question in our mind. Okay. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Thanks, sir. No, thank you. Thanks, Upasana. This is lovely talking to you and uh, whatever I could contribute. But there is a... Uh, there are books and books and books we can write on, on maternal health, women's health. And I, I, I'm hoping that everybody will stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot on behalf of Indo-American Chamber also, sir. Thanks a lot. Uh, now it's time that we should uh, see the video of Sangeeta Patel ji. She could not join because of some uh, very important uh, meeting. So now, uh, Nilu, can you please play the video of Ms. Sangeeta Patel, who is director yeah. of the office? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Greetings. Additional Secretary, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Mr. Lav Agarwal, Chairperson, National Commission for Women, Ms. Rekha Sharma, Chairman and Managing Director, Medanta, Dr. Narish Trehan. IACC leadership, Dr. Lalit Basan, Dr. Upasana Arora, Mr. Ajun Karna, private sector representatives, and distinguished guests. 
On behalf of the United States Agency for International Development, I'd like to thank the Indo-American Chamber of Commerce for having me here to discuss the important subject of empowering women with digital innovations. President Biden recently said, elevating the status of women and girls globally is the right thing to do. It's a matter of justice, fairness, and decency, and it will lead to a better, more secure, and prosperous world for all. At USAID, we believe gender equality and women's empowerment are not just a part of development, but are the core of development. Over time, we've learned that investing in women and girls is essential to transforming communities. When women do better, families do better, communities do better, and countries do better. We cannot solve the toughest development challenge of our time without empowering women economically without the, their agency and decision-making power put in their hands and without providing them with the right skills and confidence. Engaging communities, stakeholder collaborations, and technology all play key roles in building this solid base necessary for creating gender equality. USAID's collaboration with India's vibrant private sector has helped mobilize private investments to scale deepen its partnership with the government of India and helped incubate many successful women-centric sustainable market-based healthcare solutions. I am delighted that agencies like the Indo-American Chamber of Commerce are playing a catalytic role of bringing together corporations, policymakers, and community organizations to work for women's health and economic development. In September 2020, USAID collaborated with the Sewa Bharat program to lead the Building Resilient Women Entrepreneurs Initiative. In just under 15 months, the initiative has reached nearly 200,000 women across 10 states in India, increasing their access to loans, assets, and training on health, financial, and digital literacy, helping them contribute more fully to the Indian economy. The link between health and economic empowerment is very strong. When a woman from the informal economy is armed with the knowledge on how to care for her own health, she can further contribute to building healthier families and communities. Recognizing that health care is a basic need for women, USAID has taken several measures to improve access to health services for women across urban, rural, and tribal areas, ensuring access to their rights and entitlement, including health services. For instance, using technology to provide information on reproductive and child health, intended to improve the quality of antenatal care by facilitating the tracking of and follow-up of high-risk pregnancies. Partnering with the Government of India, USAID has developed a variety of patient-friendly adherence monitoring and support systems using various digital technologies that support women's health, be it instant sugar level testing or detecting hypothermia and anemia in infants or providing ECG facilities in low resource settings. USAID has had the privilege of working with the Government of India's NITI's Women's Entrepreneurship Program with NITI Ayog to support the Women Transforming India awardees in the health sector for scaling up their businesses. I'm happy to share that USAID is also developing a gender investment toolkit with a practical guide to enhance gender diversity and inclusion in investment portfolios, allowing for easier and much more greater participation in, from across gender. Our recent private sector partnership will help make high quality medical consumables and drugs accessible and affordable to hospitals in tier two and three cities, especially those covered under PMJ and state health insurance schemes. In 2020, USAID brought the National Health Authority, the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, Rockefeller Foundation, Axis Bank, Indus Ind Bank, HDFC, Caspian Debt, the Center for Cellular and Molecular Platforms, and NetHealth all together to support over 30 high-impact health solutions across the health value chain in the ecosystem, impacting ultimately 23 million lives. This is a first blended financing facility on health and has a focus for supporting youth and women health innovations. USAID, with support from the private sector, provides capacity building opportunities to youth, especially women from the informal sector, to take up occupations such as phlebotomists, death and even telehealth coordinators. USAID is also exploring partnerships with various national platforms, corporations, associations, locally led institutions, and award programs to co-create and facilitate technology-oriented solutions for women, addressing not just healthcare, but entrepreneurship and livelihood issues, and also encompassing safety and security in skilling initiatives. We encourage design 
challenges that inspire and incentivize creative problem solvers around the world to test and scale solutions to a broad range of development challenges. USAID's Development Innovation Ventures, an open innovation grants program, provides funding to pilot, test, and scale creative solutions that demonstrate evidence of impact, cost effectiveness, and the potential to scale, improving millions of lives at a fraction of the usual cost. As I close, I'd like to emphasize that technology is a means for women to realize their potential, not just limited to education, skilling, banking, and communications, but as a means to shape powerful decision makers and leaders for tomorrow. I invite private corporations to collaborate with USAID to co-create and shape development projects that help women to use innovative health approaches and digital solutions towards good health. Thank you so much. On behalf of USAID. Thank you, Sangeeta Patelji. And now I am delighted that we have Mr. Love Agarwalji with us. And congratulations, sir, for organizing such a wonderful event of G20. It was actually best of the best event I have ever attended. So now, sir, we really wish to know uh, your views on this women's health innovation. I would like to welcome you on behalf of Indo-American Chamber of Commerce. And sir, we really wish that we can do something with the G20 and GW, if we can mix something and we can again, uh, you know, organize some program on that. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Pasna Ji. And uh, thanks for kind thank words. You. And uh, I also acknowledge the presence of Dr. Naresh Trihan and uh, uh, Ms. Sangeeta Ji. And uh, a very warm greetings to the symposium colleagues. I thank actually Indo-American Chamber of Commerce for inviting me to this gathering. Uh, we're all aware the nexus between good health and well-being and gender equity actually travel ages from ancient civilizations worshipping goddesses and Mother Earth to the transition towards modern society. Actually, each leaf in the history has shaped the perception towards women's health care. The socio-economic divide at the turn of 20th century further exacerbated pre-existing health inequities between women belonging to different classes and castes. Without going deeper into the past on the issue, I would like to shift my attention and discussion towards the future of women's health. Colleagues, Global Fraternity has issued a clarion call to gear up for achievement of SDGs Agenda 2030, spanning the three dimensions of economic, social and environmental development. At the level of Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, we are working constantly to improve the successful implementation of healthcare policies at the grassroots level for women. Through flagship programs like Pradhan Mantri Matru Vanna Yojana, Poshan Abhiyan, Intensified Mission in the Dhanush, Anemia Muk Bharat, Beti Bachao Beti, Padha, Beti Padhao, the Government of India, backed by businesses and civil society organizations, has actually made a remarkable headway in translating these goals for women and child welfare into national policies. Anemia Muk Bharat is estimated to reach 450 million women and children beneficiaries. During the last six years, as an indicator, the sex at birth has improved by 16 points from 918 in 2014 15 to 934 in 2019 20. Similarly, as on June 2022, during the various phases of mission in Dhanush, a total of 445 million children and 112 million pregnant women have been vaccinated. This has in turn resulted in an increase of 14.4% in fulminization coverage as per the National Family Health Survey 2019-21. Dear friends, to ensure accrual of benefits, particularly to the marginalized and vulnerable communities, However, this requires a departure from conventional headcount approaches towards shifting to evidence-based methods like cost-effectiveness, systematic reviews, and meta-analysis, etc. The importance of technological innovations in healthcare cannot be sufficiently underscored. Inspired by the pandemic, pharma companies, startups, startups, and investors have now actually turned their attention to developing digital instruments that can improve patient outcome and ensure treat, treatment adherence. The demand for digital tools like telemedicine, remote patient monitoring has spiked 
and as these are often the only means to access medical or mental health care to ensure quality health care service delivery to every rural household in tribal areas and remote pockets i am happy to highlight that the national teleconsultation platform e sanjeevni has already taken up more than 944 million teleconsultations in india in india this digital revolution has actually left an indelible mark in fostering gender equality in social and welfare systems for instance a study of the digital governance aadhar platform in krishna district of andhra pradesh which allows the government to biometrically identify recipients of social services and subsidies including social pension found that women express stronger preferences related to men for the consistency of consistency of digital delivered benefits it also found that women appreciated the increased control over their benefits augmenting their agency over entitlement and subsidies similarly a study on mobile phone ownership and usage by women in india the national family health survey cross sectional data concluded that households where women had mobile phones reported lower tolerance for domestic violence and higher women's autonomy in mobility and economic interdependence today challenges be like anti antimicrobial resistance ncds doctors availability particularly in rural and remote areas augur a heavy toll on life and economy the rising reliance on health workforce has revealed the inadequacy of current brick and mortar structures to cater to the needs of the growing population of this country and that is where digital health comes in shifting the emphasis from over reliance on physical presence to patient empowerment enabling patients to take an active role in their treatment at home would allow the brick and mortar institutions to dedicate their energy towards more complex cases at the same time artificial intelligence can be an aid to healthcare workforce to have multiple touch points a day with the patient today we believe that the three linked area interlinked area digital access digital literacy and online safety to promote digital gender equality for girl demand our urgent attention to achieve this end initiatives like sukanya samriddhi yojana and national scheme for incentive for the girls of second education have already been launched by government of india by leveraging the government's existing investment in schools and engaging with community volunteers organization in fact can have a significant impact in ensuring that no girl is left behind from the digital revolution in this amrit kal i would like to highlight further that we need to better integrate gender into innovation cycles also to make the innovation market work better for women even with the rise of femtech startups which are focusing on women's healthcare a historically overlooked sector only 3% of the total health tech funding went to femtech startups in 2020 despite all odds femtech startups continue to break the glass ceiling as per the forecast the global femtech market size is actually projected to be worth around usd 103 billion dollars by 2030 and it is growing at 8.12% from 2022 to 2030 that is why gender advocacy must include mandating responsible gender sensitive designs and use of machine learning models and finally digital technologies pose human rights and thus women right issues in new and critical ways all the stakeholders in effect should strive to work in alignment with human right laws in the design development and use of those technologies dear friends not only is it a moral imperative but meeting women's health need and improving gender equity is an all round smart solution for the individual society and economic prosperity of country at large after all a women's health lays the foundation for her children's health her family her community and for generations to come accordingly reducing inequalities within country and communities points categorically towards socio economic and political equity and erasing of any such discriminatory mechanism which propels inequality among the people to achieve this formidable goal i look forward that businesses and global organization would join forces with government of india and take advantage of the digital era to hurdle to hurl 
the world into a future where we can completely eradicate this gender divide. I once again thank all of you for giving me this opportunity to interact with all of you and look forward that we can collectively take this battle head on. Thank you, Jahin. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, luckily, I am part of this Betty Bachao, Betty Padhao and uh, Anemia Elimination. So I can see that government is actually taking serious efforts for uh, this pro problems. And uh, I know that you are so busy. You have lots of things to do, but still you have given some time to us. We are thankful on behalf of Indo-American Chamber. I uh, thanks to you. And now, Mr. Arun Karna, please kindly deliver your vote of thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Basna ji. Uh, distinguished guests, esteemed speakers, ladies and gentlemen, you would all agree that uh, we've had an amazing start to this important interactive session on Women's Health Innovation 2023. As Basna ji said, healthy women mean a healthy nation, indeed a healthy world. Uh, already many great thoughts and ideas have come up during the inaugural session, and I'm sure that many more ideas would spring forth as we proceed with our discussions during the day. Um, I come from a technology background. I'm really enthused by the breakthrough innovation that is happening at the intersection of technology and healthcare, which is leading to really great outcomes for the humankind as a whole. And within this, interestingly, a branch of technology that is fast emerging and that was referred earlier as well, Femtech. That refers to the diagnostic tools, products, services, wearables, and the software uh, that uses technology to address women health issues. That is really coming front and center and that is extremely heartening. And uh, these technologies are leading to new applications and concepts with the overarching goal of improving women's health. And I would say in, in that way, somewhat achieving uh, the goal of gender equality uh, overall. Uh, so to me, as, as someone from the technology industry, it appears that technology is going to play a major role in achieving universal gender equality leading to a more equal and equitable world. And uh, anyway, that is the objective we should all strive for. Um, I take this chance hereby to convey our extreme gratitude to all the respected dignitaries who spared their valuable time to be with us today, despite the heavy demands on their time. Uh, so I'm extremely grateful to you, Mr. Lav Agarwal, Additional Secretary, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. We all know the important role that you played during the COVID-19 pandemic days in briefing the nation on a day-to-day -day basis about the seriousness of the pandemic, the steps being taken by the government in addressing those challenges, and also the do's and don'ts that kept us safe. So thank you so much for that, sir. We are grateful. Uh, thank you so much today also for your powerful messages uh, on the various programs that you know, under your leadership and with the government initiatives are underway in the direction of women and uh, child welfare. So extremely heartening to hear those messages, sir. Thank you so much. We're indeed grateful to you for taking time of your busy schedule today uh, to be with us and for your continued support to us. Um, our interactive session uh, was also to be graced by Ms. Rekha Sharma, chairperson, the National Commission of Women uh, unfortunately, she could not make it uh, because of uh, last minute exigencies, but we would also like to pass on our message of gratitude to her for, for her continued support to our cause. Um, uh, Ms. Sangeeta Patel, uh, Director of Health Office uh, at USAID, her message was very powerful as well. Uh, she pointed to the several initiatives underway in the areas of women's health across the socioeconomic spectrum with the US and India working in partnership, and also the challenges being faced by women's health and the need for evolving newer concepts and technologies to address them. I believe there's immense scope for learning some of the modern approaches and concepts from the USA. And I believe our two countries have a lot in common to work not only together on a bilateral basis, but go together and uh, sort of uh, help out in other countries as well. 
coming to Dr. Naresh Rehan, you know, who does not know him, he needs no introductions at all. Uh, he is our hero. Uh, his contributions to taking the health sector to the next level are very well known. He's, he's the pride of our nation. Uh, we all heard his expert suggestions for ensuring gender equality and the need for evolving gender-focused clinical therapies. And you know his, his advice uh, on the importance of proper nutrition, uh, the importance of antenatal tests, uh, how to watch out against health diseases, breast cancer, cervical cancer, osteoporosis, and also to deal with pre-menopausal and uh, you know, actually the menopausal phases of, the, of women's lives and the importance of knowing your family history. And in light of that, how to take precautionary measures to ensure a long and healthy life. And you know, the importance of yoga for overall health and to keep away such enemies as Alzheimer's. Those were all great pointers, sir. And uh, you know, we, we are deeply grateful for your intense association with us on a continued basis and for your blessings and support, which has immensely helped us in creating a new narrative in our overall functioning and assigning a major role for health and wellness in our overall activities. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Narish Sehan. Extremely grateful for that. To uh, Dr. Lalat Basin, our national president, uh, so we are grateful for your directions and in fact, giving us a new direction in our activities overall and thanks for your intense involvement in striking an innovative path in our activities, sir. Uh, you are a great source of inspiration to all of us and many, many more, I'm sure. And last but not the least, uh, I'm thankful for, uh, uh, you know, to my leadership, uh, Dr. Rupasna Arora, uh, our uh, very dynamic uh, president of the North region under your leadership, we are flourishing. And, uh, you know, thank you for uh, taking the initiative to initiate a program on such an important topic of national and international importance. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. And also, you know, thankful to everyone present in this inaugural session and hope you will continue to participate in the ensuing sessions, which are going to be equally great, I'm sure. And I'm confident that you will get enriched from the deliberations of the interactions. Thank you all. Uh, Mr. Mr. Karna, please uh, thank the secretariat also led by and Neelu Sadana. They have done a great commendable job. I absolutely agree, uh, uh, sir. I mean, I would be, uh, you know, amiss in my duties if I didn't uh, thank our uh, very dynamic and efficient uh, secretariat and all the work that's gone on behind the scenes, Neelu ma'am, Kashish ma'am, and all the other uh, supporting staff. Thank you so much for helping us organize uh, this session. And uh, I, I, you know, I invite everyone to stay on and uh, participate in the ensuing sessions. Thank you so much. Back to you, Dr. Pasna. Thank you, Arun Karnaji. And now I would like that we should uh, move on our next session, Empowering Women's Health. And uh, actually you have thanked everyone. And now I have to thank you that you are here and you are taking time out for this very important session because we are making society and without the female, we cannot even think about a good healthy society. So thank you so much, but um, stay thank tuned you. everyone so we can uh, listen our next session. Thanks a lot. Morning everyone. And now it's our uh, session, which is based on uh, empowering women and femtech. So good morning, all of you. And it's a very important session as uh, this is high time that we should think uh, special about females and women who are a creator, who are uh, actually doing a different kind of uh, uh, things for a family, not only individual, they look after whole family and society. So with these words, I would like to open this uh, special session on um, session on Femtech, empowering women's on health. I am thankful to Indo-American Chamber who has given me this opportunity that I can organize this important session. And uh, with these words, I would like to empower, uh, invite our first guest speaker, Dr. Atul Mohan Kocher, who is the CEO of National Accreditation Board for Hospitals and Healthcare Providers, NABH.
he is very good friend of mine and nabh is doing a wonderful job in different healthcare uh, you know dimensions so now dr atul kindly enlighten us with your words of wisdom thank you so much uh, dr pasna madam and i am in indeed very grateful to you and the entire indo uh, american chambers uh, for this wonderful opportunity given to me yes, uh, pasna ma'am can you switch out the uh, other window which is Friendship already open on your machine uh, on your laptop so now dr with your permission i would like to uh, share my screen i've already shared my screen am i audible and visible is my screen visible yes sir so thank you so much once again uh, grateful thanks for this opportunity i'm not an expert on uh, uh, in the field of women empowerment but this very invite gave me an opportunity to study uh, the data study the scenario and um, the statistics which have come up are very very surprising though we pride ourselves uh, uh, globally to be working actively towards uh, women empowerment and there is so much recent policy change but there are still uh, we feel that there are miles to go so uh, so uh, if we were to look at the uh, working women in india we find that about 58 crores of or 587.6 millions of our population of huge population is made up of uh, uh, women of these about 25% are working which in sheer numbers is mind boggling and if we were to look at the age group which is maximally involved is about 30 to 49 which stands to reason uh, as far as women in healthcare is concerned we find that 50% of women comprise uh, 50 women comprise 50% of global healthcare customers and are primary caregivers for elderly and the children which is a global scenario and 75% women are more likely to use digital tools for healthcare than men so these are proven validated statistics and 90% of primary healthcare decision which as dr upasna madam very rightly pointed out that women are the anchor women are the cornerstone the linchpin which hold the family together so 90% of uh, the women take the primary healthcare decision maker for their family and key influencer they are key influencer for their friends also and 80% of household healthcare spending is done by women working at female spend 29% higher so effectively worldwide including india they are the main decision maker for the healthcare not only for the children but also for the entire family including the elderly if we were to look at status of women in the healthcare workforce we find that women represent a mind boggling 71% of global healthcare workforce and women are estimated to make up 30% of doctors and more than 70% of nurses and midwives because traditionally these have been the uh, role models which have been attributed to women so they still continue to occupy that despite large number women are five times more likely to face disruption in their pathways and in the healthcare sector earn an average 28% less than men so that glass ceiling still abounds and women in health contribute more than 5% to global gdp which is more uh, worth more more than us uh, 3 trillion annually or more than the gdp of uh, india presently if we were to look at who figures we find that in the current executive board of who uh, the men outnumber women by nearly 100% while worldwide only 27% of women are involved and world health assembly chief delegates only 26% of women are there but that number is still catching so the top four challenges that women face are low low paid or unpaid work absence of a nodal agency which 
it is to their interests and there is a gender bias and harassment which may or may not be there uh, but has to be tangibly felt and lack of networks and support systems which are specifically geared to the interest of women are also lacking uh, however the motivation for opening a business when a thousand women were uh, surveyed it was found out that they wanted to pursue their own passion they were ready to be their own boss and when opportunity presented itself and they were they were grossly dissatisfied with the corporate these are the us figures so uh, they with the corporate uh, america so that is the motivation for them to open their this thing and many were laid off so they could op and thereby opened their own businesses so for the small businesses these are the top six challenges lack of capital inflow marketing advertising time management because they have to have handle their families also administrative work recruiting managing so despite all the challenges we have found that the femtech or the technology innovation in in the field of healthcare led by women entrepreneurs is steadily growing and entirely based on their dedication inspiration their fearless nature their indomitable will and being their true warrior resilience courageous multitasker and patient so all these are the qualities of women which are today prodding them to take leaps and leap frogging the men in the femtech divisions so the way forward is that uh, in the future we see that more investment in creation for opportunity i'm sure today's panel discussion will throw up all these and we will end up discussing all these factors that how women today despite all the challenges uh, continue to work with resilience to build all these things so in this niche area and what all we as an organization can do to support these initiatives which are steadily moving forward on their own steam so this is the way and as far as our national accreditation board for hospital and healthcare providers is concerned we are very proud to be manned or rather women by majority of uh, young ladies who work shoulder to shoulder or in fact they are exceedingly i mean men are a minority at nabh but they all work exceedingly well and they have taken cudgels on behalf of the healthcare industry the accreditation industry of india deliver Uh, uh, record uh, uh, decisions in a record time so i feel very proud of that and i am very thankful and in the times to see uh, use of increasing technology is the only way out we can bridge the gap by reaching out to our far and wide in tier 2 tier 3 cities so thank you so much for this opportunity once again thank you thank you dr kocher it was wonderful presentation rather i would ask this presentation for my uh, next lecture because you have presented very good data and uh, nabh is having very good data from different hospitals also so we can you know think about women's health and we can you know empower those females who are not able to get their place whatever they deserve so thanks a lot for taking time out from your busy schedule now i would like to invite dr rayan ingen who is economic strategy unit chief economic environment science and technology affairs us embassy over to you uh, dr rayan thank iacc and the organizers for putting together today's event and for inviting us to speak i agree this is a very important topic and the more you dig into it uh, the more you realize how important it is i was also very pleased to see that there are so many leaders from across sectors Uh, participating in this event uh, including government academia research and industry uh, from our perspective the reality uh, is that this is only by working closely together both across industries and across borders that we can usher in an inclusive innovation society for the benefit of the whole world uh, so i've been asked to speak about the us government strategy for women's economic empowerment so to do so i will first explain why we care so much about this issue then what are we doing globally in general and in india in particular and finally say a few words about how all of this applies to the specific topic of women's health innovation so first why does the united states care so much about women's empowerment 
So as many of you know, uh, there are not many issues in the United States that enjoy bipartisan support between our two parties uh, and continue to be a major priority from one administration to the next. But women's empowerment definitely is one of those. This is especially true as we move into the post-COVID world. Women around the world bore the brunt of the consequences of the pandemic from being forced to leave the job market in greater numbers, becoming teachers of their kids at home, and sadly experiencing a large spike in incidents of domestic violence as they found themselves trapped at home with their abusers during lockdown. The United Nations, the World Bank, and many development economists have come to a very simple conclusion. The most effective way to promote inclusive growth and development is to empower women in general and in the technology industry in particular. So the reason for this is quite simple. Women make better choices than men when it comes to uh, investing in their families. So of course I'm generalizing, but there's a growing body of research that is all coming to a single conclusion. The more power is given to women, the more prosperous and peaceful that society becomes. On the economic front, women's economic empowerment uh, is arguably the single most important thing that the countries of the world can do to boost economic growth and promote equality at the same time. Women are the most untapped resource just waiting to be unleashed. The United Nations estimates that empowering women has the potential to add $12 trillion to the global economy. Nothing else, not trade agreements, not the development of new technologies, nothing we do in our day-to-day -day lives even comes close to its potential. This is the most important issue there is. Also, empowering women also leads to more peaceful societies. Research from the World Bank makes clear that the more women are excluded from the economy, the more likely that country will be involved in conflict and will respond to a threat with immediate violence. But when women are empowered, they bring national stability. It is for this reason that the United States national security strategy recognizes the critical role of women in achieving global peace and prosperity. So what is the United States doing globally to, to address these issues? So based upon this understanding of how important it is, this month in January of this year, the United States announced the first ever interagency U.S. strategy on global women's economic security. This strategy lays out a vision in which women and girls around the world in all their diversity can fully, meaningfully, and equally contribute to and benefit from economic growth and global prosperity. Pursuing this objective from our perspective is both a moral and a strategic imperative. Through our efforts, the United States government will aim to foster equal access to education, innovation, quality jobs, and decent work including through entrepreneurship for women and girls around the world. We envision a world in which everyone has equitable opportunities for job placement, advancement, quality of life, and leadership. So to accomplish this aim, our strategy has four key lines of effort. The first is promoting economic competitiveness through well-paying quality jobs. Second, advancing care infrastructure and valuing domestic work. Third, promoting entrepreneurship and financial and digital inclusion, including through trade and investment, and four, dismantling systemic barriers to women's participation. All of these can and should be done in the context of women's health innovation. So what is Mission India doing on addressing women's empowerment in general? So all of Mission India, our embassy and all of our consulates across the country, take women's empowerment as one of our top priorities. The rationale for this is simple. The United States wants India to take on a greater leadership role, both in the region and globally. Its ability to do so will depend upon it growing economically. We have identified two primary drivers of growth over the next several decades. The first is the one that everybody talks about, of India becoming a new hub for global supply chains. So a supply chain shift, India is well positioned to capture a large share of this shifting production, first as an exporter to the rest of the world, and then later as foreign firms seek to tap into India's growing domestic market. But the second largest driver of growth is the empowerment of women. 
As the statistics from the previous presenter showed, India's female labor force participation rates are in the mid 20s. If India could simply bring up, bring this up to global averages, it could add trillions to India's economy over the next several decades. So we coordinate our efforts at, in Mission India through our Women and Inclusion Working Group, whose mandate is to promote the values of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in all of our work not just for women, but for all marginalized groups, including LGBTQ individuals, religious and ethnic minorities, and people from lower castes. Specifically, our work on women has, our strategy has three levels to it. The first is advocating at the top. So here we engage with senior leaders in government, industry, academia, and civil society about why they should make women's empowerment a top priority. So this event would be an example of us implementing that. The second is on upskilling in the middle. So there are large gaps between what India's educational institutions are able to produce and what the world needs for India to live up to its full economic potential. So we're working closely with the private sector to try to help fill that gap in particular for the benefit of women. And the third prong of our strategy is growing from the bottom up. So I understand earlier my colleagues from USAID spoke. Given India's huge population, putting money and power in the hands of the grassroots women can produce transformative results for hundreds of millions of people. So how does this all apply specifically to women's health innovation? So I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm joking here, but it's not that much of a joke. Generally speaking, we can say the technology industry so far has largely been dominated by men and men who appear to have what one famous market observer equipped, uh, a singular focus. Uh, so this observer said, San Francisco tech culture is focused on solving one problem. What is my mother no longer doing for me? So entrepreneurs solve the problems they see and male entrepreneurs solve the problems men see, but women entrepreneurs, women tech entrepreneurs are going to solve the problems that they see. So tech culture, unfortunately, has not always been open and receptive to women. Quite the opposite, actually. Women's experience has often been characterized by exclusion, hostility, and sexual harassment. This is a huge mistake on both economic and national security grounds. Emerging technologies provide unparalleled opportunity for every woman, every female entrepreneur, even those selling baskets in remote villages, to become the head of a multinational corporation. The combination of new technologies and the empowerment of women has the potential to lift millions of women out of poverty around the world and change the culture of our tech businesses in positive ways, all while bringing about much needed goods and services to consumers. This is particularly true in women's health innovation. The unique health experiences of women are often some of the biggest potential barriers to women fully participating in the economy, and technology can play an important role in solving these issues. So several examples. First, is there's underinvestment in health and nutrition among girls, uh, um, uh, nutrition of girls by families due to cultural values that still prioritize boys. So as they're growing up, they just simply don't get as much food and, and health access to nutrition. Second is equal access to clean and reliable toilets. This is still a major issue for, for hundreds of millions of people around the world. There's also the impact of the lack of feminine hygiene products on educational trajectories and what, what, are, girls, what are girls to do in addressing those challenges. Additionally, there's the family planning issues that so many, that family planning issues so women can raise their families and win their situation and their timing works best for them. There's also everything associated with childbirth itself, prenatal health care, giving birth, having to leave the workforce during that time, and the medical care for new mothers and their children afterwards. And finally, how women face disproportionate burden for ensuring for the health, welfare, and raising of their, raising of their children. So all of these, from our perspective, are women's health issues, and technology has the potential to make a huge difference in addressing these challenges. I'm not confident that Silicon Valley's uh, tech bros are going to be developing the solutions to these problems, but I'm pretty confident that femtech in India can. So in conclusion, for the United States, we, fe we feel India is uniquely positioned to take a leadership role in femtech and the United States can make a great partner. 
Prime Minister Modi said in Bali that he wanted to make women-led development a central theme of India's presidency of the G20. Integrating femtech into that could be a useful, useful avenue. We also normally, when we think about femtech, we're thinking about women in North America, Europe, and Asia, and because that's there's there's money there to be made in that market. And while this is important, I think the larger market can actually be found in the global south, and India has an important role to play. So as we all know, India just surpassed China as the world's most populous country. Femtech innovations can go a long ways towards raising India's women out of poverty. And Africa's population is expected to triple between now and the year 2100, rising to 4 billion people. Femtech that specifically targets developing country women in India today will play a huge role in helping Africa develop in the future. So engaging with, the, with industry and so forth on women's health innovation is a natural priority for the United States Embassy and our consulates in India, both in terms of our U.S. strategy for women's economic security, but also the work of our Women and Inclusion Working Group. More importantly than all of that, though, is that these efforts can make a real difference in the lives of literally billions of women around the world, and we are eager to be India's partners on this front. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ran. And I really uh, happy to listen to you and I can understand the, how much work US is doing to uh, encourage females to you know, come forward and creating more, more things for their own. So you are basically focusing on empowering females and we are lucky that we are having this Indo-American chamber so we can work hand in hand and we can grow like that. Thanks a lot. With these words, I think now our next speaker is here. So uh, I would like to tell something about Dr. Pai, if he is there, because he is the one who is the president of the Fox. president. Of okay, now I, I would like to uh, invite Mr. Bhanu Prakash Kalmat SJ. Our topic is empowering women entrepreneurs in health and wellness. So Mr. Bhanu Prakash uh, will, uh, is uh, actually partner and sector leader in healthcare and life sciences, Grand Thornton Bharat LLP. And Mr. Uh, Bhanu is going to talk about how we can uh, enhance women empowerment and entrepreneurship and health and wellness field. So Mr. Bhanu, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh... Is my screen visible? Yes, very much visible. So, yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, IACC and uh, Upasani ji for giving this uh, you know, opportunity for me to touch on this most important uh, topic. Um, I think you know there's a lot of discussion has already happened, uh, interesting insights. Mm, I would probably share some perspective about the sector, the opportunities, and how this can be tapped by the women entrepreneurs to further drive the femtech agenda. I've, I've used various sources, acknowledge those resources, primarily from an interest of sharing the information. I think, let me start with a broader perspective. Today, while the half of the population, in a way, it's, if it says, is just around half of the population is women, only 4% of the medical research budget is spent on women health, right? That gives some perspective on how much today the scenario is. And... And if you really look at, in that context, what's the opportunity available in future, uh, the wellness economy, it's a $5 trillion uh, market globally, and you'll see the various aspects of wellness economy in terms of the growth opportunities. India is, is expected to grow around 20% CAGR in the wellness over the next three years to reach around uh, $876 billion. So there is a large opportunity for the uh, women to, you know, to grow businesses in this segment. And I mean, you will see definitely wellness, tourism, mental wellness, personal care and beauty, because these are some of the aspects where the femtech has, has flourished. So there is definitely a large market for it to be tapped. Uh, while this is on wellness as a segment, um, if you really look at femtech, I think today the femtech segment cuts across consumer, e-commerce, healthcare, life sciences. So the largely the focus has been technology enabled consumer centric products uh, primarily on maternal health uh, menstrual health uh, pelvic and sexual health uh, you know, fertility 
and so on and so forth aspect. I think also the smart devices. So the, those have been the sub-segments within the femtech segment, which has attracted the investments or what we have seen the 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 companies which have flourished in femtech in these uh, uh, segment. Uh, and I just thought, okay, let me give some perspective about the femtech as an industry. I think uh, femtech as an industry is uh, USD $97 billion market, which is expected to be by 2030 around 16% uh, CAGR. The Indian market is expected to be around uh, $100 million by 2025. I think what is interesting is, is also you will see the graphs on the right in terms of the investments which are happen in the femtech market in India, the funding, you will see the steep spike uh, from, you know, I would say I leave the 2020 as an aberration because of the COVID, $27 uh, million to $71 million to $90 million. So that's the investments which have happened. So there's a lot of activity which has happened in this market, a lot more to go. Uh, when I really look at what's the drivers for this segment, you know, really in terms of, you know, what's the drivers for the femtech segment, um, I think, you know, the, the prevalence of the disorders, you know, the, the focus on menstrual health, the cervical and breast cancer related is what has driven the market. I know also the, the increased use of smart wearables and the demand for personalized approach uh, by the women. That's also one of the other uh, aspect for growth. Uh, is also, I think most important is the increased awareness. And also many of these platforms provide the privacy and the customized solution which women demand today. So that those are the sort of drivers, but I think all these drivers have an underlying theme today that the education in the uh, of women the global exposure, increasing awareness. I think most importantly, the changing social attitude towards women has been some of the underlying principles for the driver in this uh, uh, segment. Now, when I really look at uh, one is the driver, um, you know, it's also about if I really look at the supply side, you know, how do we see so many women entrepreneurs in this uh, segment? And I sort of zeroed in, you know, while you'll see on the left side a lot on the healthcare and life sciences, but on the right side, they're also general in nature. Fundamentally, there are a lot of women who enter the STEM education, the life sciences related streams. So hence you will see natural, you know, uh, affinity or in terms of more women entrepreneurs from for the fem, uh, femtech segment as compared to consumer or others. Also, the a lot of work which has happened in the healthcare and life sciences on gender equality, diversity initiatives. I think the work from home has only accentuated that uh, uh, the opportunity for women to be entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm more covering broader as, as women who are in the segment. They have an opportunity to build their professional skills and then become entrepreneurs in future. I think on the right side, you'll see, uh, which is general for all segments, not necessarily to healthcare. Um, there has been a proven um, sub, you know, research by multiple universities that good governance is driven by diversity and inclusion plays a key role in good governance and obviously good governance get, uh, gets better valuation in the market. So again, d &I agenda sort of helps to in terms of makes business sense for, uh, for women and entrepreneurship. The companies had, had has played its own role. I think it's also about today there is a empirical evidence that the understanding of the customers is better by women because of the because of their curiosity and, and their interest. So these are the aspects which have sort of also driven uh, uh, you know health and uh, healthcare and life sciences focus in the femtech uh, segment. Now this is also proved by our research. We did a survey, uh, Grant Thornton did a survey in 2022 globally covering uh, on women in, in business. And some of the interesting statistics today, if you see the highest proportion of women in senior management out of the 15 industry surveys is in healthcare and life sciences. Uh, life sciences companies are, you know, the gender pay parity is 10% better, better in the life sciences. 10% is higher, uh, you know, hiring has happened in the life sciences segment. So there's a lot of work which has happened by the ecosystem, which is also encouraging uh, uh, women to be entrepreneurs in, in this uh, uh, segment. Uh, that's in terms of the, you know, the why aspect. I also just want to touch a little bit about the, the challenges we are seeing in the sector today. Uh, the primarily, if you really see the, the key challenges for the sector, while a lot has happened, there's a lot to grow. I think some of the aspects which we need to reflect on is uh, the, the lack of awareness of the uh, segment, especially in the rural uh, area. 
there is a rural urban disparity education issues i think it's also uh, a sort of seen as a taboo to talk on some of the aspect which has sort of created a hindrance to further grow this market on the business side uh, the investors see this as a niche market you know the moment you see it as a niche market obviously uh, there is a you know some hindrance on will this market scale will the will the segment scale because of which the, obviously the funding related challenges come in and and also the understanding of the women's health uh, issues by the wider population so that's i think these are some of the issues which have we have created i would say sort of you know can create a challenge or have created challenge for the femtech segment to grow further but i i'm sure i think the things which are happening in the market uh, some of these will we will overcome in the near future while i see these are challenges i thought i should also close it with what we see as growth opportunities there is a bright uh, light as we see there's a light in bright light in the head of the tunnel some of the aspects which are driving the growth in this segment is uh, the as as dr kochar also mentioned the the working women population which is a substantial population which is driving uh, the growth in the sector today the gen z is is very particular they take their ownership on the health which is is good again you know sort of drives the the growth in the sector telemedicine interestingly you know many of the the femtech related products are technology platform based uh, the technology is a great level uh, it can help in terms of greater penetration of the telemedicine to the wider uh, the I would, if we have to say hinterland of india which also sort of enables the femtech segment to grow uh using telemedicine as an opportunity and of course um, you know the growing awareness we need to do a lot more on female health awareness uh, particular in rural uh, areas i think this will sort of drive some of these uh, changes some are happening i would say not all these are are already happened some are happening some we need to do more um now from a business side when i really look at um, today i think there are opportunities to look beyond some of the you know the four or five segments which today femtech has seen uh, there are opportunities to look beyond uh, uh, menstrual hygiene uh, there can be you know there is a menopause is a significant area which can uh, you know femtech can you know um, look at which can definitely solve the real issues of of women uh, the using of ai ml technology to develop better products so there is an opportunity to look at how you know femtech segment can tap this market to develop use ai ml to develop new products uh, of course our smart digital solutions today wearables is attracting a lot of uh, uh, investments all of us have seen the apple watch new coming up with some of the uh, real specific so there are a lot of activities happening so uh, digital smart solutions the technology driven market is definitely an area which we see uh, the growth uh i think there was also dr egan touched about uh, mr egan touched about all about uh, women investing in women health we see today a lot of funders particularly women fund funders who are investing in this so that's an interesting space uh i'll probably close with the last uh, but not the least it's the most curious aspect for me i think the esg funds will drive a lot of investment in the sector the social element of the esg will will also drive there's an opportunity to tap this funds to grow the femtech market uh that's from my side thank you thank you so much mr bhanu prakash and it, your uh, presentation was very 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 uh, informative and uh, it is very helpful so we will ask you to give it to us sure and uh, with these word we are lucky that today we have uh, dr rishikesh pai who is the president of the federation of obstetric and gynecological society of india foxi Uh, we will have his special address because we are talking about women's health and he is the right person who can talk more about women's health and i am lucky that i am part of his uh, uh, this drive of uh, eliminating anemia so dr pai uh, it's over to you uh, thank you uh, madam uh, one minute i'll just uh, resume it sorry and to actually dr pai timer at 10 minutes yeah. okay so basically i would like to thank the indo american chamber of commerce and madam upasna and especially for calling me here i don't know what to say because i have so much to say i've been in the medical field i'm 62 years old now so nearly 30 god knows since uh, i was at uh, 17 i entered medicine and first of all i would say that i must thank the government because without their free education i would not be here as a doctor so for me 
the most important thing my whole being is because of my existence is because of the government free education that our country given and i want to we all want to give back to the to the so the federation is a is like the ima of women's health unfortunately the foxy the federation of gardening societies of india is not that known slowly slowly we are getting known we are 40000 gynecology we are the custodians of women's health but when i see so many people so many funders donors they don't know anything about the federation we are the ultimate end point where we touch the women all the time whether it be in the private sector or the government sector in the urban areas or in the rural areas we are the people and we actually take care of the half the population nearly 600 million people that are women and we take care of that population as the federation this year by being the president my slogan every time the foxy president has to give a slogan i am the 61st president of the federation and i gave the slogan called change it is known as badlav in hindi and i've defined it by three words the first word is known as ekikaran integration our rules are all dispersed in different directions we need to give them a single direction so integration in terms of when you touch a woman tell her about everything in about health in her life so that she gives that get awareness is there whenever we have the touch point we need to give integrated thought to that women we need to look at a woman in a integrated fashion not in you know tuberculosis malaria anemia mental health uh, different groups are having their own agendas but ultimately if we integrate those agendas then only we will be able to transform the women in this country so integration is my first point the second point is samanta equity as they call it abroad i have defined it as equality because indians they don't understand equity what you are talking about equality they understand equality so equality on the republic day day after tomorrow i will launch the second part of my philosophy of equality of gender gender equality is very important and that gender equality is the key so equality about when there is a caste equality of men and women that is gender equality equality of the rich and poor is also a very important equality of religion so we have to give healthcare equal to everyone and that's the challenge you know how can we because india is two parts 1 billion indians are there who are disadvantaged when i did my yatra i started my yatra two months back i started it from rishikesh and i started traveled 4000 kilometers i touched 21 cities i did camps everywhere and i saw that there is a lot of people they are they need that touch they need social entrepreneurship health care cannot be for making money out of health care not possible health is a basic right we have to do it we have to use people like you your your uh, you know generous donations and utilize that money utilize government has done a lot for our country's population it has done tremendous our maternal mortality which was 600 has fallen down to 97 per 100000 it our sdg growth by 2030 2030 probably will reach which is 70 so we are having fantastic evolution because the government has put in a lot of money in healthcare there's a lot of infrastructure being built the philosophies have changed so all those things are happening but at the same time the private sector also has to put in a lot to help the government we can so we have to pay back all the time so if you look at the technology part of it now coming to the third part of course of my slogan of badlav was takniki technology so utilize technology to implement the change create the integration and create the equity the equality to make the change in healthcare so this is the philosophy and when i look back and my gynecology i was very fortunate i told you that the major breakthroughs in medicine came during my last three decades of my life ultrasound endoscopic surgery uh, fetal monitoring you name it ivf i uh, one of the pioneers of ivf in the country all that happened in this last three decades and now we have to now that the vertical growth i feel has suddenly become less so now we need to have the horizontal growth we need to reach all these technologies to 
all the 1.3 billion people in our country and one of the important parts of that reaching that technology is data big data collection integration of data is very important and we have moved in that direction the government is having a lot of vision to collect data every person who has a health treatment it goes to a doctor data has to be entered otherwise how do we know what is happening in this country so data entry is very important and in uh, uttar pradesh for example unicef and foxy has got in and created the mantra app which is a very important app with the labor room app and i have told them that let's create a master data sheet we should not wait for governments to say okay dr pai you better do the data collection we have to have a internal drive to say okay government we will do the data collection so it's important to have a data system into place and voluntarily make all our members collect that data and input it because when we input it then only we'll get to know what is the problem in this country where we can do the targeting and the second thing i also the administrator of the foxy manyata initiative which we are upgrading nursing home so we need to upgrade our care as well so lot of technology has been used for data collection upgrading our uh, for example now in the endoscopy robotics has come in so huge amount i can't tell you about what's happening but there are four important points that are very important from the uh, because i'm working a lot with other uh, uh, international agencies and some of the important points are one is iron deficiency anemia the anemia level in the national family health survey number 5 has not gone down so anemia is a big challenge for the country and my yatra was to target it and now there are new technologies like you don't have to prick you just have to put like a you like a oximeter you just put it on the finger and you can make out whether she is anemic or not because people are scared to get the prick done so that's one challenge the second area is so we have two types of maternal mortality one is pregnancy related mainly related to postpartum hemorrhage sepsis and hypertension in pregnancy and the second is the area of cancer cervix so one of the second big areas of killers in our country in women is cancer breast cancer followed by cervical cancer followed by oral cancer and followed by colon cancer so these are important areas which we need to target and let's uh, the hpv test is a big player in that area and preventive aspect in the form of a hpv vaccine is also going to be a big game changer the federation has already asked the government to provide it in uh, their whole uh, you know vaccination program of the government so they will subsidize the vaccine and give it to it by giving that vaccination will be able to reduce the incidence of cancer so so those there are certain areas which are important but i think it all because we have a lot of infrastructure available it all boils down to awareness and it all boils down to us all coming together in one direction it's very important and awareness has to be see you know we all the time are talking about digital come on how many of our indians at the ground level i have gone to the juggies i have gone to the villages how many of them have got you know i was just now in andaman i could not get the internet myself i mean they, we still are so we have to reach that last mile and you know i remember my dad he was from harvard university public health personality he used to go to the slums and he used to communicate with them when i'm talking about 1970s well that has to be done we have to reach the last mile we have to communicate we have to build the awareness if they don't know about anemia how are they going to you know when i was uh, i had uh, just one last parting because i know the time is a problem when we were doing the yatra you know i was we went to the banks of the ganges in uh, alabad and you know it was 7 o'clock in the morning and we put our we have a video we had a video rat we were playing the video madam upasna knows about that video rat where we have created a cartoon film of 12 minutes which tells everything of a woman because i wanted to create a cartoon film i said how can i communicate to a uneducated person so that the only way i could do it and there were people who were there were small vendors girls women who were selling things we called all of them together and we were talking to them and i said how do i do it how can i communicate to this space of people they don't they are scared to go to the hospitals also how do we do it so there is a lot of challenge let me tell you we are sitting in our ivory towers but we i really appreciate all of you you have that dedication in your mind and we have to get, go on doing it we have to go on doing it 
and one fine day will reach the ultimate uh, goal of health for all for everyone thank you very much madam for giving me this platform to express my thoughts thank you dr pai rather we are lucky to have you here even we are uh, uh, our uh, american partners are also here so they they are also listening to you and they madam and i must tell you the us government I, it's a fantastic usa has been great the gates foundation we have lot of projects with them them it's the japai go you know they are great i mean they are good people they are good at okay. heart it's very important to have goodness in your heart and they have it so we are all democracies and we need to work together more strongly to achieve our goal so dr pai now i am going to include you in our uh, you know healthcare committee in indo us chamber so we can get your views on many things which which is really required in healthcare so thank you so much for taking thank your you. time out but same time i have a question from you like we were talking about uh, this cervical cancer so can we uh, do this test as popular as this rt pcr and we can encourage people to go for their test because same machines we can use for hpv also so what is your opinion yeah we see cervical cancer there are three aspects to it one is known as test testing yeah. is the you know, but the most important is visual examination see the problem is that women in india na they are very shy about vaginal examination and this is a big challenge you know so they they have to be counseled so but visual you cannot replace visual examination let me tell you the other day i was chatting with someone you know in the in uh, and she said dr pai you are so right i had this patient i did the test and i just put the speculum and there was a small teeny weeny polyp which popped out of the cervix i took a biopsy and you know it was a adenocarcinoma she was 35 years old and i did the hysterectomy and they, the whole family is grateful so if we do just the test it is not enough we must do the visual examination visual examination is the basic test so that has to be done along with the pap smear and the hpv test it is a integration people are saying nahi nahi test karo test karo no visual examination is the main step but the problem is not only for uneducated people my mother we have five gynecologists including one of my brother in law is in us we have five of us and till the age of 87 she is no more now she never did a pap smear in her life so i mean it's not just the educated uneducated but the educated women also don't do the test so that is one thing the second is the vaccine but vaccine will prevent the hpv but you can and the third is of course early diagnosis and treatment what i am saying is that when in our yatra one of the things we realized is that lot of people have not done pap smear in their life also so there is a big issue there so what i want you to you all the guys your technology guys are here now the biggest thing is people have not aware so that something called preventive health prevention is not there in their concept only in their mind we have to push that preventive help that they have to come they have to do their checkups i mean forget the uneducated educated also don't go to the doctor once in a year so and you know there's a new technology which is very exciting this is uh, you know you can take the blood and you can actually isolate the precursor cancer cells because one of the killers is the cancer so we we can actually isolate the precursors and find out which cell is coming from some okay there is a cell from the spleen we can try to locate that and try to look for the cancer before it becomes clinically apparent this test is a new test which is still debatable controversial but it will become more and more perfect and that's uh, so you know there's one guy called harari the author he has said that women will live till 150 years and many women will get married at the age of 75 again because the longevity is going to go up because with the preventive testing if we can pick up diabetes we can pick up the cancers and we can pick up the heart disease we can prolong longevity and that's going to be the future thank you thank you dr pai it was wonderful listening to you and came to know many things and i think everybody who has joined us they must be getting so much benefit from your talk so thanks a lot thank you no Yeah. Now I would like to invite Dr. Pri Pal Thakur, co-founder and director, Glamgo Technologies Private Limited. Dr. Pri Pal Thakur, over to you. Yeah. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, uh, first of all, 
thank you so much uh, for providing me an opportunity to speak uh, in uh, such a distinguished uh, list of dignitaries. So, Dr. Atul uh, Kochar uh, and uh, Dr. Rajiv Sen, uh, Dr. Rishikesh Pai, all of them are the veterans of the industry and uh, uh, we look up to them uh, when we uh, are trying to do our uh, bit for Indian health tech uh, in general and more so uh, also trying to include uh, how we can have a more inclusive uh, sort of offering for uh, female section of the society. So at the very heart, uh, Glamio Health is a tech enabled startup which is focused on providing secondary care surgical uh, treatments uh, to the vast majority aspiring Indian middle class, uh, primarily uh, trying to partner with the hospitals and doctors and then uh, sort of a solving for the key pain points of accessibility, of affordability and convenience that a patient typically faces uh, in Indian uh, healthcare delivery ecosystem. Now, uh, Coming to the topic, uh, which uh, is uh, on the hand, I think some of the previous gentlemen have already uh, spoken uh, and covered many important uh, points. One point that I would like to uh, sort of uh, cover here uh, and uh, shed some light uh, would be the way uh, technology startups can uh, improve uh, the female uh, health in India because a healthy female is 50% um, empowered uh, female, right? So most of the females in, uh, in India and given the uh, sort of a, uh, given the mix uh, of the folks who are on this call, uh, almost all of them are seasoned uh, sort of healthcare practitioners. So I don't need to sort of uh, belabor uh, the point, uh, but the last national family health survey I mean, showed a picture of uh, gender equality and healthcare in India. So here, uh, what we could see uh, is uh, that while some progress has already been made, but women's key health needs uh, very simply can be uh, sort of divided amongst two, three large uh, categories. One uh, which we've seen is nutritional insufficiencies, anemia being the most sort of a particular of that uh, category. Hormonal uh, disorders, right? And then non communicable diseases like thyroid dysfunction and so on and so forth, right? I mean, so uh, these uh, have uh, affected uh, all aspects of women's life, including their social life, personal finances, workplace productivity, uh, right? So, so I think uh, the point that I would uh, want to use this platform is to bring attention towards some of the startups uh, which have started solving these uh, problems primarily by using technology, uh, right? So uh, I think uh, where we stand uh, uh, now is materially different from where we were roughly five years ago before uh, the advent of Geo. I think with the advent of Geo, now uh, what uh, we as uh, tech entrepreneurs have uh, is a distribution pipe which reaches to uh, even the remotest uh, of the country. So by one uh, admission, roughly uh, 700 million people in India have uh, mobile phones uh, or smart mobile phones uh, with them uh, and uh, can access internet, right? So on this huge distribution pipe uh, that has been created largely thanks to the geos uh, push uh, on the internet connectivity, I think a lot of solutions are being layered. Some of the startups that uh, are doing good work uh, in this space. Uh, I mean, there is a company called Proactive for Her. Uh, it's a woman-focused healthcare startup focused on providing teleconsultation related to PCOD, menstrual health, uh, some of the uh, issues which uh, have been taboo for Indian uh, women uh, and uh, even in the metros, uh, right? So uh, what these tech startups are offering is uh, anonymity uh, to the women. So women can uh, come log in on this startup and then uh, sort of share their problems and then uh, get consultation initial and then later on go on to uh, sort of get a, a requisite uh, treatment, right? So uh, this, that's one startup that uh, comes to my mind. The second startup is a, a startup 
called Hera, uh, which is again a Hyderabad based uh, startup, uh, which is focusing again on uh, pregnancy, sexual health, and general well being of the woman using technology, right? So, so the point that I'm trying to make here is uh, that over the next uh, five to 10 years, uh, I think health tech entrepreneurs have to focus on one key uh, constituent uh, of uh, the population, which is female, because female is not only a pivot uh, for, or, or not only a 50% uh, uh, by numbers, but they are a pivot for the family uh, unit. So a female health uh, is uh, cascading uh, in that sense, right? So one uh, sort of a suboptimally healthy female will impact a huge uh, generation, right? So most of the health tech entrepreneurs have started focusing on uh, female uh, sort of uh, offerings, uh, right? So I think over the next five to 10 years uh, with the advent of new technologies, with the advent of uh, uh, internet of things uh, and the wearable devices, a lot more work can be done to reach the last mile for even the most rurally placed uh, females. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Preet Pal. And it was wonderful to listening to you. Now we have to move for the next session, which is empowering women entrepreneurs in skill and awareness. And for this, we have Ms. Jyoti Kaur, former DDG Service Export Promotion Council. She has a vast experience, so she is going to tell us more about this. Over to you, Jyoti. Very good afternoon to all uh, distinguished panelists and uh, a lot has been spoken and to Upasana ji, to uh, Dr. Atul Kocher, Dr. Ryan, Dr. Bhanu Prakash, Dr. Pai, Dr. Prikpal ji and of course our honored guest Ra Mr. Rajiv Kumar Sen who is the advisor from the MSME. Uh, definitely I would uh, I'm thankful for this uh, being a part of this panel which is a very important panel on women and um, a woman with a voice is by definition a strong woman, but the search to find that voice can be remarkably difficult, as rightly said by Melinda Gates. Women empowerment through skill development is her economic participation and empowerment to strengthen their rights and enable them to control their lives and exert influence on the society. Women empowerment and skilling has got five components basically. That is women's sense of self-worth, their right to have and to determine their own choices, and their right to have access to opportunities and resources, the right to have power to control their own lives, both within and outside the home, and their ability to influence the direction of social well-being. The difference between skill and talent, a skill is something you learn, but talent is what you can't help doing as rightly said by Caroline, and no country can ever truly flourish if it struggles the potential of its women and deprives itself of the contribution of half of its citizens, rightly said by Madeline Michelle Obama. For he who has health has hope, and he who has hope has everything. The parameters under the uh, leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister, which talks about India heals, that's heal by India, heal from India. And by 2030, India will have the world's youngest and largest workforce exceeding 1 billion. Adoption of global best practices in skilling becomes very, very essential. Best practices comprise the recent relevant and helpful nursing practices, methods, interventions, procedures, or techniques based on high quality evidence and value-based healthcare services can be rendered to the world by creating a talent funnel. And we talk about setting up an agenda for exchange of programs of doctors, nurses, technicians, paramedics, etc. Holding educational programs, awards, quizzes to encourage the talent pool. Setting aside a fund member to set up specialized institutes to create global doctors and nurses curriculums, as some of the universities in India are currently doing and develop a skilled workforce for strong, sustainable and balanced growth, prioritizing education, lifelong learnings, job training and skills, development strategies linked to the growth strategy of the country, and setting up a guide to standards 
largely agreed upon. Almost a workforce, 57 lakh 60,000 doctors, nurses, midwives, pharmacists, dentists, healthcare associates are present. And 18% of the foreign workers currently are Indians. Skilling in assessing of hazards, vulnerability, and public health capacities is the need of the hour. Of course, there are three types of skills, functional, self-management, and special knowledge. Functional skills are abilities or talents that are inherited at birth and developed through experience and learning, whereas self-management skills are the behaviors you have developed in learning to cope with your environment and the people and the conditions in it. Examples are being energetic, determined, resourceful, or dependable. That's where we need to concentrate upon as far as our women health is concerned. Special knowledge skills are those have to do with mastering and specific body of information related to a particular type of work, profession, occupation, educational or leisure activity. Accounting, catering or real estate brokering would be examples of this. India's competitive advantage, of course, lies in its large pool of well-trained medical professionals. India is also cost competitive compared to its peers in Asia and Western countries. The National Skill India mission is very highly concentrating on dental hygienists, being quality parameters being set up on chiropractors, then health service managers, clinical psychologists, nutritionists, medical physicists, paramedics, nurses, orthopedists, pharmacol vigilance officers, optometry technicians, health visitors, OT technologists, telehealth coordinators, COVID frontline technicians, histo technicians, radiology technicians, and cardiac care, etc. According to our healthcare reports, with a diverse range of medical services, there are about 11 lakh allied health professionals in the country in the categories of nursing associates, sanitarians, medical assistants, medical equipment operators, optometrists, traditional and faith and healers and psychotherapists, dietitians, and dental assistants. Although the expenditure on health has been on the rise, the per capita expenditure on health in India is Indian rupees 3,844, which is significantly less than that in other, other than the developing countries. For example, it is Indian rupees 16,988 in China. In the next few years, changing trends like increasing penetration of insurance, changing demographics, increase in consumer awareness and rise in chronic and lifestyle related diseases will result in increased healthcare spend. Various standards are set and of course require the updating. International institutional tie-ups play a very vital and important role with the perspective to upscale our skills in healthcare. For example, we have tie-ups in India with like community services and health industry skill council in Australia. We have a tie-up with British Association of Physicians of Indian origin and global associations of physicians of Indian origin and others. The technological progress, new business models, climate change and COVID-19 pandemic are changing every aspect of the life, including workplaces and expectations at work. These changes impact the skills, need for job and way they develop these skills. Our future skills encourages collaboration, innovation and transformation. Collaboration to work together across sectors to identify and take action on common priorities. Innovation for prototype, test and evaluate innovative approaches to skills, assessment and development. And to transform, ensure policies and programs meet job seekers, workers and employers evolving needs. There are many more international bodies with which uh, through IACC I would propose that we could even tie up. The Future Skills Canada, the Skills for Health in UK, the Netherlands Health Silk Skill Council, the India Sweden Innovation Centers, and India Japan Skilling. Skilling and supporting nurses will help India achieve the sustainable development goals, which is the mantra for today. Nurses are a vital resource for achieving health and development goals. They are the backbone of any healthcare system. Any Patient coming to any hospital in India is definitely remembers the experience before and after any kind of procedure is the nurse attendant. 
5,000 nurses, it is sad, are leaving every year from India. Capacity building of nurses is important in order to guide them to their contribution to the development of nursing services in India and to ensure the provision of quality and safe essential health services to the people. Nearly three-fourths of the population in India live in rural areas. And for a large segment of this population, as was also said by Dr. Kocher, especially those living in far-flung areas, consulting a qualified physician is a remote possibility. Young physicians raising, raised in cities aspire to specialize and are unable to live and provide primary health care in remote and difficult areas. India, along with more than 150 countries of the world, is committed to ensure healthy lives and to promote well-being of all at all ages. Nurses can help meet this commitment if they are skilled, supported, and mandated. Skilling nurses to become primary healthcare nurses, of course, skilling the nurses for assessment and management of common illnesses, like, for example, malaria, typhoid, or conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, and use of standard protocols helps significantly in ensuring quality of care and minimizes chances of error. In addition, the PHC nurse needs to be well-versed in communication techniques and effective social interactions and skilling standards need to be set up for that too. So as to instill the necessary behavior change, promote compliance, especially for difficult conditions and ensure greater community participation. Skill, S for skilling, K for knowledge, I for initiatives, to L, leverage L, life. We would take it that way. And building a strategy for a resilient, adaptable, and a sustainable skilling and awareness environment. The need for strategic skills, new economic forces, a changing policy environment, and increasing demands to address chronic diseases, coupled with significant transitions in the governmental public health workforce. Need of the art is the strategic skills. The new strategies and commitments, we need to elevate strategic skills to equal status with specialized skills. Invest in strategic skill development, build systems, not silos for better communications, collaborations and management. Develop effective and engaging trainings, create a coordinating mechanism and new skills for changing needs, the systems thinking, change management, persuasive communication, data analytics, problem solving, diversity and inclusion, resource management and policy engagement happen to be the most important parameters. With an eye towards the 2030 deadline to achieve a sustainable development goal, the UN has also come up with a very strategic plan for women in health. In India, we have programs like Mailai Heart by the Ministry of Women and Child Development and women entrepreneurs are given this opportunity to showcase their technology and present their products on an online platform. Similar initiatives are, can be planned even by our Honorable Ministry of Health, although there are very good programs already in existence, which were mentioned by Mr. Lavagabal earlier. Skill transformation in the healthcare sector, the use of analytics and automation to solve the system inefficiencies has created demand for new talent, artificial intelligence and robotics, specialization in mathematics and expertise in data analytics are imperative. Innovation and experimentation is essential to upskill or reskill the new age force. Living amidst change, the leadership framework also needs to evolve to start fostering the sustainable work culture. Of course, the road ahead is, it is no longer just about adapting to digital technologies. We now live in an age of digital disruption. It has changed the traditional healthcare landscape. The use of technology for upskilling the workforce is essential. Learning agility needs to be there to ensure a mix of training models that align across generations of employees, Special, specifically in the healthcare domain, which works on a people-first approach. Trainings need to instill a high degree of intellectual humility, empathy, and malleability. With this, I would like to thank everybody. Thank you so much, uh, and uh, it was wonderful to know about your, you have collected 
very good data and you have uh, explained how we can go further. So with these words, now we are lucky that today we have our special chief guest, Mr. Rajiv Kumar Senji, Senior Advisor, MSME, Health, WCD, Niti Aayog. Sir, we are really happy to have you here and waiting for your word of wisdom. Over to you, sir. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, first, let me let me thank uh, you, the organizers, for inviting me in the presence of such an august audience. I have learned a lot of things from whatever I could heard, but I'm sorry. I overshot the uh, earlier meeting time by almost 45 minutes, so I missed quite a part of it. However, you know, the, the, the feel could be, you know, from the earlier two speakers, I could gather that, you know, the, the importance that we attach to women and health together. So I think, and that's the topic, and we have already discussed a lot. And I would request uh, you, uh, if you could send me the, uh, the, the audio clip so that I could sort of learn a lot from the earlier speakers, whatever they have said. Now, with these words, I will just uh, make a, so a short, uh, you know, uh, presentation or rather a speech on what are the things that from the Niti perspective and from Government of India perspective, we would like to highlight. So our understanding of health is becoming increasingly broader. It is It now not only means being free from illness and diseases, but also aware of health promotive behavior and ability to choose from a pluralistic health system, multiple healthcare options and prioritize overall well-being. Concurrently, healthcare delivery mechanisms also continue to expand their scope to become more comprehensive. As is being discussed here, technology and innovations have played a very important role in healthcare from diagnostic tools to medical devices to efficient data management systems and even in clinical decision, decision making support. Advancements in technology is changing the face of healthcare and creating opportunities for entrepreneurship across the board. It is not surprising, therefore, that the market size of Indian health tech startups is estimated to reach 21 billion by 2025, while the total addressable healthcare market is likely to skyrocket to around 650 billion by that time. Due to the aging population of the world and emphasis on enhancing human development indicators like mortality rate, morbidity, life expectancy, etc., the demand for professionals in the care related sectors is growing exponentially. Studies also indicate that around 9.94 million additional care jobs would be created in India in 22-23, with 53% jobs for women by 2030. Now, this is as per a NITI study. Sensitization and wide publicity on skilling courses, programs is being done both digitally and offline. Short promotional videos on success stories, covering various jobs, job roles, women, etc., social media, have also been taken up. Participation of women have been instrumental in both innovation and strengthening health systems and also delivery of health uh, services. We know that with over 12 lakh ashas and anganwari workers, public health has greatly relied on the capabilities and community of capital of women to positively impact health outcomes of the country. Our female health workers have shouldered behemoth tasks of not only addressing maternal and child health, but also unprecedented, unprecedented events like the COVID-19. Globally, women are usually the care decision makers in their homes. Certain areas of healthcare, for instance, women and child healthcare system require not only a female perspective and forwardness, but also a more channeled strategy to get positive outcomes. This global pandemic has only reinforced the need to have women in leadership roles as their different perspectives, intuition, skills, and rel relationship building can help solve problems in meaningful, innovative ways across business functions. Concurrently, introduction of flagship assurance schemes by Government of India, like the Ayushman Bharat and the Digital Health Record, created with, has created with over 48% of those registered being women who provide greater access to quality healthcare and ensure continuum of care like never before. Inspired by the Honorable PM's clarion call to ensure gender equality as key to a progressive India, the government has increasingly focused on promotion of women-led development. So we are moving from women's empowerment to women-led development. So that's the change in focus and strategy that has been envisaged by our Honorable Prime Minister. 
Accordingly, various initiatives at the government level, such, such as the Digital Literacy Mission, Pradhan Mantri Gramin Digital Shaksharata Abhiyan, Aadhaar Enabled Payment Systems, and Digidhan Abhiyan, among others, have focused on leveraging technology as a tool for empowerment of women to lead from the front. India's startup ecosystem is currently the third largest in, largest in the world. Over 45% of these startups have been founded by women. As innovators and entrepreneurs, women are striving continuously towards shattering the glass ceiling and driving important change across all spheres of development. Niti Aayog's Women Entrepreneurship Platform has also proven helpful as a one-stop shop for women entrepreneurs to access information, learning modules, and also provide loans, support, and mentorship digitally. A recent report on women premiers by the Atal Innovation Mission, which is again an in initiative by the Niti Aayog, highlights the contribution of women entrepreneurs to the field of healthcare through innovative tech solutions. Many women have been able to overcome the bottlenecks and shape the industry and created platforms to revolutionize the health industry. As we all know, women entrepreneurs are essential to healthcare. The health tech startup is a fast growing industry where numerous startups have been launched in the past few years to enable quick delivery of medical care, diagnosis, prevention and treatment plans, and quick delivery of quality services. Women entrepreneurs should also push the frontiers and tap the fast growing market. Yet, there are gender disparities in the entrepreneurship for healthcare. Firstly, men working in science and technology fields disproportionately outnumber women. Access to internet and associated technology can be a restrictive factor for women as they traditionally face socio-cultural barriers. This is particularly true for those residing in rural and remote areas. Indian women spend 299 minutes a day on unpaid domestic services, whereas their male counterparts spend around 97 minutes. This is a NSS study in 2019. So women spend four times as much of their time than men on unpaid domestic services. Notably, nearly half of the women in Indian cities have online exposure as against only one third in rural India. Significantly data, significantly, data suggests that women's access to internet and to smart, smartphones is much lower than men in both urban and rural areas. According to the GSMA Mobile Gender Gap Report 2021, 25% women own smartphones, 25% women own smartphones compared to 41% men in India in the year 2020. Online exposure has a vital role to play in the women's labor force participation, which we all know is abysmally low compared to the countries similarly placed. For online exposure to translate into better labor force participation, women require a certain minimum level of skill and resources. Women are less likely to own mobile phones and digital devices due to both, as I said earlier, economic and socio-cultural restrictions. When disposable income in a household is scarce, it is often the male members of the household who get to spend on purchase of digital devices like mobile phones and laptops and computers. Women need to be imparted digital skills. We need outcome-oriented skill training programs for women that can train them in non-traditional skills and onboard them on platforms, a point which Madam Jyoti Kaur had already made earlier. Additionally, female entrepreneurs often, often lack access to venture capital and professional mentorships, which make it harder for them to establish a startup. Forbes reports states that since 2011, venture capital dollars granted to only women teams are a meager 1.8% to 2.7%. However, the field of femtech is increasingly, increasingly expanding with a reported funding of almost three times. The pandemic has shifted the business model to an inter internet-based one, which has created setbacks for women. While 53% of the women own a mobile phone, the digital penetration in terms of mobile internet usage by women was likely to be 33% less than that of men. Thus, their digital inclusion is imperative to enable them to capitalize on the tech revolutions in the healthcare sector. Further, there is a need to develop new services tailored to the specific needs of women. Training and mentoring of women to build their capacities to further unlock their potential is essential. Simultaneously true to the femtech motto of by women and for women, per pervasive health conditions that affect the female population like endometriosis and several autoimmune conditions could be prioritized 
by femtech firms to bring to the mainstream of healthcare through deep understanding and innovative treatment and management procedures for women according to google and bain company report 2019 india has seen an increase of women entrepreneurs from 14% to 20% in the last decade women entrepreneurs are shaping the future of india with 20.3% of women are msme owners accounting for 23.3% of the labor force yet the contribution of women to india's gdp is estimated at 17% as compared to the global average of 37% with the share of women led micro small and medium enterprises being a meager 14% McKinsey Global Institute study found that advancing women's equality could add 12 trillion dollars to the global economy by 2025. In a best case scenario, that number could jump up to 28 uh, million, uh, trillion dollars. That is roughly equivalent to the size of the combined Chinese and US economies today. Therefore, there is a need to empower, fund, promote women-led tech initiatives that develop low cost and accessible solutions to the diverse health and well-being issues that plague the indian population it is only through harnessing the scientific and entrepreneurial trem- temper of women in this country that we can usher in holistic growth and development so with that uh, and you know i would also like to mention that in the recent past there have been many schemes as madam already said earlier uh which have been un, uh, st- uh, launched by the uh, ministry of women and child development and health also and we hope that this schemes would not only you know put women in the forefront but would also enable them to start you know to take up disruptive actions in this field of health health tech and generally in the overall economy so with these words i spend i i uh, sort of come to the end of my direction thank you thank you sir thanks a lot mr rajiv it was wonderful to listen to you and i think we need to meet and we can you know we can uh, put our points in front of you and we will get guidance from you and then we can work together for empowering women in um, you know is sk- skilling them and make them awareness and you know motivate other females who are not working and who are not even know about their potentials so because government is these days actually taking so much interest to enhance women empowerment as well as trying to you know focusing on gender equality so we need to uh, work together on behalf of iacc indo american chamber of commerce and on behalf of my national president Dr Lalit Bhasin ji I am really thankful to you that you have given your valuable time to us and insight to us it is going to be very useful for uh, all those who are listening to this and we are actually planning to meet you very soon so thank, thank you sir you. it was a wonderful session if i uh, go through today's session uh, which is started at 11 o'clock we uh, there was dr nadesh trehan ji Uh, who is actually uh, epitome of knowledge and he is uh, uh, basically a uh, torch bearer in healthcare and then we uh, listen to sangeeta patel ji who is director health officer usa then india then uh, our honorable secretary mr love agarwal ji was here and he uh, additional secretary ministry of health and family and he is actually organizing all these g20 events also and uh, luckily i was part of that so i can see that the way government is organizing this g20 summit and hosting other countries it is going to be a game changer for india all other countries who are visiting india they will now came to know what is real india which uh, many countries were not even aware that how how uh, you know technology friendly we are how progressive we are and india's infrastructure is now very well uh, developed by the government and then uh, our uh, uh, regional vice president mr arun karna who gave a vote of thanks then uh, there are many other speakers who, uh, who are here like dr atul mohan kochar who was ceo of nabh he gave us a very good uh, presentation and i think we need to go through once again so we will be able to aware about empowering women entrepreneur in health innovations so um, and then uh, our us government is, uh, economic sec- uh, strategy unit chief mr rian was here 
he also talked very good about all the um, uh, initiative which uh, USA is taking and we we are supposed to now work together because this chamber is uh, not about only India. It, this chamber is about India and USA. So when both the countries, because USA is already working very hard for women empowerment and they are actually working very uh, closely with the, our government also. So it is going to be very, very nice if uh, both the countries will work together and then we can come up with the very uh, good results and outcomes. Then Mr. Bhanu Prakash was there and he has given a good presentation of healthcare and life sciences. Then our uh, very own Dr. Rishikesh Paiji, who is a uh, basically pioneer in um, IVF and everybody knows who uh, about IVF, they know Dr. Rishikesh Pai and he is a FOXI president also. And nowadays he is on a mission of eliminating anemia. And luckily I am part of that. So I know that how he is doing actually very hard work. He is reaching each and every corner to meet people, to tell them what is the value of your, uh, you know, uh, health. So females should aware about their health, their well-being, only then we can create a healthy society. So, sir, most welcome and thank you so much. Then uh, Dr. Preet Pal Thakur was here, who also given a, a good presentation to us. And uh, then our former DDG Service Export Promotion Council, Ms. Jyoti Kaur, she has given a very good uh, statistics, which we can utilize and we can go accordingly. And, you know, there are big scope to improve more. And thanks a lot to our chief guest, Mr. Rajiv, sir. You came here and you have given your valuable time to us, which is very, very, uh, very, very fruitful. And this, your uh, speech has given a encouragement to all those who has joined this uh, webinar. And many people who are listening to us, they must be knowing how uh, this government is uh, interested to, you know, change the whole scenario, which was there, but now government is working on a different way and we are actually getting more and more support from the government. With these words, I think today's session was really very fruitful, very um, um, enhancing of knowledge and very, very, uh, actually I should say this session was encouraging for females who are not even aware what they can do, how they can, you know, add value to this society. So um, I think we should uh, uh, promote this session through YouTube and other social media. So more and more uh, people should see and listen to our prominent speakers and can get the benefit of this. With these words, on behalf of Indo-American Chamber of Commerce, I thank you all who has come to us and who has given their views to us and all those of all those who join, us also. join us also. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.